Merry Christmas to all of you. It's good to have you. Uh, those of you at home, the kids, we just had our kids program and they did phenomenal. It was, it was a great opportunity. But today I thought, you know, I, I, there, there's so much misconception going around. There's so much misunderstanding, untruth to go around, especially when it comes to the things of God. I tell people all the time, I didn't grow up in church. I, I didn't. I didn't grow up knowing the Lord. Uh, until I was 17, almost 18 years old, did I even discover there was a God that didn't hate me. Because growing up, of course, God always hated you. God always hated everything you did. God hated every move you made. God was just mad at you. You know, I had a grandparent that was always mad. And I'm like, is that God? Is that how I picture God? He's always mad at me. And then it wasn't until I discovered the love of Jesus Christ that I understand that God's love is eternal. God's love is unconditional. God's love is just waiting for me to accept it and to receive it. And when I did, it radically changed my life. And it changed my view on so many things. And it changed my understanding of how much God really loved us. So I thought, you know what? We're going to look into God's word and discover and dispel some of the uh, misnomers, the uh, misunderstandings of what God's word or what God is all about. And I entitled this sermon this. In his own words. In his own words. There's a game I, we used to do it when we were youth pastors uh, called the telephone game. Any of you familiar with that, the telephone game? All right, what you do is we usually had a receiver, and being a youth pastor, I'd usually take just disconnect the phone in my office and just hand it to the kids, hoping that they would never bring it back so I'd never have to answer the phone again. That worked for a while until my senior pastor found out, and then I, of course, had Pastor Steve come speak to me in my office. Happened a lot. But anyway, so what the telephone game is, you give somebody a, a receiver, a telephone, and you read something to them. Like, Sally went shopping with Sue at Kohl's. It just came to me. I'm Just work with me here. Okay. Or cheer a God, a 40% off at Kohl's, and I haven't seen her for six days. Now, that would be, that would be better. That would be truer of that. But anyway, so you tell the first person that, and then you bring somebody in the room, and then they have to, without looking at what you just read to them, they have to take the receiver and tell the person what was just said. And then that person leaves. Another person comes in, then they have to do that. And by the time you get to number five, how twisted it is, by the time you get to number 10 or 12 or 15, it is totally bizarre what has just gone down the line. Like, it's no longer Chira, it's... Uh, it's Charlotte, and, and she moved to Nebraska, and now she husks corn. Okay, that's how bizarre it, it happened. I didn't work with me. It's, nothing's written down here. But that's how it is. It's just so bizarre. And the reason is, is because every time you hear it, it's said differently. It's said differently because man is telling man. I, I, Cher and I have been married for over 42 years. And there's been times few that I have miscommunicated to my wife. Very few. Maybe just a few. Let's go with just a few. And I will speak something and she will interpret it the wrong way, which I'm like, how could you possibly misinterpret it the wrong way? Because she said I said it wrong or I said it with the wrong tone, which has happened. But the fact is, is as we speak, things change. So what I wanted to do, I wanted to dispel anything of what we think God is or who God is. And we want to look at what his own words are. And I, the source of where we're going to go is to God's word. If you're new to the firehouse, I just want you to know, we believe in God's word. We believe it's infallible, which means there's no mistakes. There's no typos. There's no punctuation, no things that are wrong. And every word is perfect. Because it's been, it's been inspired by the divine Holy Spirit of God. It is the truth that has stood the test of time. It is never changing. Man will attempt to change God's word. Man will always try to manipulate God's word to make God's word fit man's situations instead of allowing God to, instead of man adapting to God's word so that man's life fits to, man, to God's intentions. So we're going to look at God's truth. We believe in 66 books in the Bible, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Every word in between, 100%, there's no doubt. 
God has promised us truth, a never-ending, never, never changing truth. He's promised us this. And often when man passes it down from man to man, the word becomes changed. The word becomes different. And compromise begins to come in to, again to fit man's situations. And it's so important that we go back to what, what did God say and who did God say he was? A question I've asked, and, and, and many do, why would God's son come to earth? If you're, if you're new here and you don't know me, I love Christmas. I, I do. I love the birth of Jesus. I love it. it it's, and it, it's, it's just a great time to celebrate. But mine is the Resurrection Sunday. I'm, I'm an Easter guy all day, all day long. I, I just, I'm an Easter guy. I love the empty tomb. And when I get to heaven, I hope that uh, if they have reenactments, that maybe I can watch the actual reenactment. I mean, the robe was good. Don't get me wrong. They did a good job with, I think it was the robe, correct? Did Cecil B. DeMille do the robe? How many of you know what I'm talking about? The robe, remember the robe? Okay, same guy that made the Ten Commandments with, with uh, Moses and Yul Brenner as Pharaoh. Come on now, work with me. This is interactive here. But I would like to see the resurrection of Jesus. I would love to see the looks on those guards' faces when the, when the stone was ro rolled away and when Jesus walked out and a new day came. See, but I, I've asked the question, many have asked it, why, did, why would God send his son to earth? What was the purpose? What is the purpose? See, Jesus declares very plainly his reason for coming to this earth. It is found plainly in Scripture. I'm, I'm not going to give you an opinion. I, I'm not going to tell you my opinion. I'm going to give you God's word directly from the mouth of Jesus. And he's going to tell us why he came to this earth to seek and save those that were lost. See, it is found in scripture. It's not heresy, hearsay. It's straight from the heart of God. And I wrote a little note here. Many people have been hurt, even damaged by the so-called truth that lie in man-made religion and because of that if you're sitting here today as i was as a kid thinking god hated me god was always mad at me god wasn't looking out for the best interests of me he was only looking out how to control me as as i share god's word to you please try for this moment to to remove that filter where you're going to hear god's word but you're going to hear it through that 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 filter of of pain and and sorrow or anguish or hurt or whatever, try to remove that filter completely so that when you hear this word, you truly hear it and allow your heart to feel it. And that's what we pray, that God's Holy Spirit would speak so clearly to you that you would understand the reason for His coming. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, it's in one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, the beginning verses, verses 1 through 13, I'm not going to read it all, that's not the main text, but I want you to kind of understand where the main text, what's coming out of it. So here in these four, 13 verses, Jesus went out into the desert for 40 days. He went out there to be alone with God. And during those 40 days out in the desert, he was tempted. He fasted for 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, the enemy, the devil, shows up. And he does... Three types of temptations to Jesus. I wrote them down just a briefly thing. First one, he took a loaf of bread. Now, how many of you have ever fasted? Whether Okay, how many of you have ever fasted for your physical? Okay, probably all of you. Some of you have fasted for church. We Once a month, we do it. I, my next physical is not till October of next year, and I'm already hungry because I was told I have to fast. I don't know how that works. You know what I'm saying? Some days I'll go without eating till later on in the day, but as soon as you say, hey, you got to fast, oh, man, I'm hungry. You know what I'm saying about it? You know so Jesus went 40 days. And what does the enemy do? He takes a stone and he says this. He said, you can turn a stone into bread. Which, nice warm Italian bread, a little of olive oil, a little cheese, a little butter. You know what I'm saying? And I know Jesus was Jewish. He wasn't Italian, but I'm... I'm sure he could have very, very easily. But what did he do? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 3. Jesus says this to the enemy. Man does not live by bread alone. Spoke truth right to the devil. I think the devil would get saved one day. 
Then the second time he says, he took him to the top of the mountain and he showed him the kingdom. He says, look, this all can be yours. It's like you coming to my house and walking in my house and say, hey, this can all be yours. I would look at you, hey, moron, it already is. But Jesus is a little different. And he quoted scripture and he says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 13, fear the Lord and serve him only. And then finally, the third one was he took him to the high point on the top of the temple. And he said to Jesus, he said, go ahead, jump. Because the angels are supposed to protect you. Go ahead and jump. I, I dare you. And Jesus quoted the scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6, number, verse number 16. He says, do not put the Lord God to the test. It's interesting this, that the devil twisted the word. He twisted the word. He tried to make the word sound, sound. Like it was a good word. But here's the thing, who he's talking to. In the book of John, Jesus is told, Jesus, we're told that Jesus is the word. The word is God. The word was God. The word is Jesus. So really what he was trying to do is twist Jesus' own words when Jesus was like, no, you can't do this. Let me just tell you the truth. Straight from the Savior's mouth. So the reason and the purpose, now that you understand that, he's been there, he's been tempted 40 days, he left, the angels came and ministered to Jesus. He was, he was made strong, but the temptation, he needed to go be alone. He needed to face temptations. Why? Because we all do. And he wanted to show us that no matter what comes our way, that God's word is stronger and more powerful than any temptation that we ever face, if we only stand upon his word. So here then, what's the purpose? Go over now in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, and I'm going to begin reading at verse number 17. So Jesus was in the temple, and actually he was in Nazareth, his hometown. And it says that while he was there, he stood up, he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. So Jesus was in the temple. Jesus went into the temples wherever he went many times to teach and to listen. And they respected him as a teacher. So I don't know if it was his day. We're not really told if he was chosen or if it was just maybe they were trying to trip him up. I'm not sure. All I know is scripture says that he stood up to read and he was handed the scroll of Isaiah. And it says that he went to, he found the place where it is written. And it's important that we understand because this was divine appointment. This was Jesus' time to tell the world exactly why he came. Beginning in verse number 18. Now Jesus is reading this out of Isaiah, which at that time was written probably hundreds of years before Jesus was alive. The prophet Isaiah throughout the scripture prophesies about Jesus, even prophesied in Isaiah 53, 54, he actually prophesied about Jesus' death on the cross. But here, Jesus is going to read out of the book of Isaiah, divine appointment. He says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord, his favor. Jesus, in his own words, written by Isaiah, proph prophesied by Isaiah, this is what Jesus was coming for, was handed the scripture, and he read this exact passage to show the world, this is why I'm here. In verse number 18, first of all, it says, that the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He was anointed to preach the good news. He was anointed by God's Holy Spirit had come down to say, this is the one. When Jesus was baptized, if you know the story, when John the Baptist, his cousin, baptized him in water, it says when he came up out of the water, a dove descended from heaven down upon him. It was a symbol of the Holy Spirit anointing him for the job ahead. And here then he was handed this scroll where it says he was, I, the anointing is upon me. Proclaiming to the world that Jesus is just not some fly by night, that he has been sent by God, anointed by God to come and do a purpose. And the purpose was to seek and save those that are lost. I thank the Lord for a God who didn't give up on me. 
And I pray the same for you, that you understand there's a God who loves you. He isn't going to give up on you. If anybody gives up on anybody, it's us giving up on God. And we run from that. But God says right here, Jesus says, I have come, I've anointed to do what? To preach the good news. See, no one told me about the good news. I always thought it was bad news. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, Steve, the principal wants to see you. You don't think that that's ever good news. You don't think that he's going to give you student of the month. You know, the, no, you think there's other things going to happen. It was the same way with God. What, it's good news. When I first found out that God's word was good news, I was like, wow, I, why would a God be mad at me and always have good news? And then they're saying he has good news. I didn't understand that. But the good news was hope for all mankind. It says that he came for the poor. For the poor. Not those financially poor. Because i got to be honest with you. Being in Haiti, being in Costa Rica, being in Mexico as many times as I have on mission trips. Mark's been at 60 some different times on mission trips and been all over the world. You see it if you've ever seen, been on a mission trip, you see the, 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 the situation that people live in and how poor some people can be. The, the poorest place I've ever been uh, is in Cape Haitian, which was in uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. It was a slum inside of a slum inside of a slum, if you can believe that. And literally, in these little cardboard shanties, there's streams of sewage that just ran literally directly through these little cardboard shanties. They had a little bit of dirt on that side. They had a little bit of dirt on this side. And the sewage just rolled through. People were filled with disease. The guy came up to me, had no nose, had a blue rag stuffed in his nose, where his, his thing was. Another lady brought up to me, and Stephen was only a year old when I went there. Lady came up to me, and our interpreter, she was from Canada, and, and, and the lady was speaking to us in Creole, and she had a baby about yo big in her hands, and the baby was so thin and, and so frail, and, and she reached out this baby to us, and, and she, as she's t talking, the girl starts bawling her eyes out, and I said, w w what is she saying to us? And the mom was like handing this child to me, and she says that she wants you to take this child, her child, to the United States, so she this baby can have a chance. The baby was two years old. The mortality rate is over 60% in this, in this slum of slums. But you know what I found? Believers in Jesus Christ living in that with the joy that I have not seen held by any American in anywhere that is full of everything. They were the poorest of poor, but that's what Jesus came for the poor in spirit. See, when you realize, see, you got to get to the place where you accept the fact you're a sinner. Now, you're either going to live with the fact you're a sinner or you're going to ask Jesus to save you. It's all up to your choice. Some people are very content going, yep, I'm a sinner. I'm going to stay that way. Okay. Okay. One day you'll face the judgment. But I tell you what, as someone who was a sinner, who's now a redeemed sinner, and to discover how much God loves me, I tell you what, it's a lot better on this side than it is on that side. Because he came to give us, preach to the poor, the good news. Those who are spiritually bankrupt, those who are empty, those who are hollow. Those who have a debt that can never be paid. That last song that they sang, man, that, that grips me. That grips me when I think about the price that was paid for my salvation. Jesus is talking. He's telling everybody in the synagogue, this is why I have come. And he says that God, he, God, has sent me to do what? To proclaim freedom for the prisoners. To proclaim, to, 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 to announce, to, to, to shout it out. There's freedom. There's freedom here, folks. There's not going to be freedom ever found in religion. There's not going to be freedom ever found in a man. But there is going to be freedom found in Jesus Christ if you seek it out. Question. Do you... Or do you not want to be free? That, that's, it's not, well, maybe. No, 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 see, you can't, you can't, no maybes. Do you or do you not want to be set free? Because if you choose you want to be set free, Jesus is right there going, I'm, I'm, I'm there, I'm your guy. If you choose not to be set free, Jesus is still your, your savior, but you haven't received him. He says, I've come to proclaim, to announce. The same way that shepherds were all in the field and, and the song was playing, Oh Holy Night, in the background, and 
the, the, the angels with the, their wings and they showed up. You know, I don't want to take away Christmas from you, but this is how the story goes. Shows up and they, what do they do? And, and, and then they, they uh, why did they do that? First of all, to scare the bejeebies out of the shepherds. I would have done it that way. But they did it to do what? To proclaim that there is now a Savior that has come. It's an announcement. It's not, hey, by the way, Jesus is here. No, by the way, Jesus is here. Jesus says, I have come to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. Those shackled by the burden of sin. Those who this world has taken a hold of. There's people, some of you are walking around with chains all over you and you think you're free. But when in truth be known, when Jesus Christ appears to your life, you discover the chains who he can set you free from. And then he says, I've also come to bring recovery of sight to the blind. I'm going to recover your sight. I'm going to make you see again. Again, here's where religion damages so many people. Here's where words spoken out of, out of context can destroy people's future because it blinds them to the truth of the gospel. The enemy brings this veil and covers them over so that they can't possibly see the truth. And Jesus says, I have come to bring recovery of sight to the blind so that they may be able to see. Those who have not lost the light of the world, that they now can see brightly again. Jesus wants you to see the love of God. He wants you to see the love of his Father. I wear this little wristband. It says John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. And then verse number 17. For I have come into this world. Why? Not to condemn the world. But to save the world. He also said he's come to release the oppressed. He's come... To those who have been weighted down by life, by sin, by shame. Shame is a terrible weight to carry. But Jesus Christ through his blood, through the sacrifice, can remove the shame from your life. But you choose. You can choose to hang on to the shame because it's like a good old friend that smells bad. But you're going to hang on to it anyway because it's a good old friend. Jesus has come to release you from that. Those that have been weighted down by life, those who can... No way measure up to religion. Man's religion, nobody can measure up. I'm just telling you right now. Without the grace of God, nobody's going to make it. God says, I've provided a way. I've made a way for you. Draw near to me. Accept my son. He sacrificed for you. I bring you freedom. I bring you sight. I bring you freedom. You can be free from your chains. And then finally, in verse number 19, it says, He come to proclaim the year of the Lord, the Lord's favor. See, he's come to announce this. Jesus himself says this. He reads out of Isaiah. I don't believe it's a coincidence. I don't believe it's, wow, did you see that? I believe that it was God's perfect timing at God's perfect place so that Luke could record these perfect words so that here 2,000 years later, we could be sitting here looking at our watch going, man, I hope he's done soon. And that that way, this word would come true that we would be able to hear this is the exact reason why Jesus came. Then it goes on to say, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying this to them. This is, this is remember E.F. Hutton? Any of you? I just said E.F. Hutton, what you all should do. Exactly, because when he speaks, what was he, a financial guy? I don't even remember. Just one of those things rolled around, dropped in my head. There you go. Okay, so now everybody in the synagogue is looking at Jesus. And he's just sitting there. And then he speaks. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now again, that's pretty plain. Today, this scripture that I just read out of Isaiah has been fulfilled what you heard. Now folks, Jesus just stated to the world 
why he's here. Why he came. And this is something you have to understand. If you were the only one left, Jesus would still have come for you to save you. No one in this room is special. No one in this room has a leg up. No one in this room can show, well, they can show your, your church, their church pedigree, but nobody really cares. But nobody can be one up on you because why? Jesus died for us all. So in his own words, that's why he's come. To bring sight to the blind. To set the captive free. And to proclaim God's freedom. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your truth, for your word. I pray, Lord God, that it will penetrate our hearts, all of our hearts. God, whether we're, whether we're walking with you, whether we once walked with you and have walked away, whether we've never walked with you, whether our hearts are hardened, I just pray, God, for your Holy Spirit, that these words, your word, has been anointed in the God that it pierces the darkest of hearts. And that, God, that you will draw them near. And people would come to that place of surrendering and know the freedom that is found in Christ Jesus. I ask, God, that you comfort those who are troubled. I ask, God, that you heal those that are broken. I ask, God, that you seek and save the lost. With your eyes closed for just a moment, we do this every week at the firehouse. So it's not like this is something different here because you're here. But we give people the opportunity to begin this journey of knowing Jesus in their life by leading them in a prayer. And if you're at home, you can pray along with me. But the fact is that we, I want to give you the opportunity to pray, to start the process by you saying you're going to surrender your life to God and you're going to accept Christ in your life as your Lord and Savior. And then you're going to begin to walk with Him and grow in Him. And we're here to help you. And after I'm done, there will be day, Mark's going to be up here. He, he'll be up here if you want to talk to me as some information, whatever you need. We, we want to help. But you've got to start the process. So how we do it here with every eye closed, heads bowed so I can see. Starting on my far left, so this far section. If you want to pray with me, look up at me. All I want to see is your eyes. Once I see your eyes, you can close them. Sure. Cool. Got them. Okay. Middle section. Anybody? Yep. Any others? Sure. Cool. Got them. My far right. All I got to see is your eyes. Cool. All right. Pray this from your heart. Jesus. I bow before you. I give you my life. I receive you in my heart. I make you my savior. Set me free. Bring sight to my eyes. Let my ears hear the truth. I accept you and I begin today my journey. In Jesus' name I pray and ask. Amen.